And Lamech, who's one of the uh, grandchildren of Cain, says unto his wife, at wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, you wives of Lamech, hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. Okay, so what he's saying is he, he's been involved in a murder. If Cain be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. And so there's the implication there that the tit-for-tat process has begun. Cain kills Abel. Abel, Cain's children kill seven. Cain's grandchildren kill seventy-fold. And then Tubal-Cain pops up on the horizon, and he's the person who makes artifices of war. And so the story, in its fragmentary manner, ties the individual psychopathology that's resentful and revenge-seeking to the proclivity for broad-scale warfare. And this really hit me because I was interested particularly in what was happening in the Nazi camps with the guards. Because the guards were gratuitously cruel. And I was very curious about that. And so here's an interesting story. This was in a book called uh, Ordinary Germans. Hitler's Willing Executioners. And it was a book that was written about 30 years ago that challenged the idea that the Nazi phenomena was top-down order following. Which I don't believe, by the way. I think that that's a very... Uh, weak, weak hypothesis. Fascistic societies are fascistic at every single level of organization. Spiritually, within the family, within the local community, it's like a holograph. It's the same absolutely everywhere. It's not top down. I mean, there are leaders who get produced and maybe they catalyze it, but to blame it on the leaders is to forget about the process by which the leaders come to be. So, no, you don't get a pass that way. So here's one of the things that happened. Um, as the Nazis started to lose the war. So here's what you should have done if you were a Nazi and you wanted to win the war. You should have enslaved the Jews and the Gypsies and had them work, right? You had the, should have had them work for the benefit of the victory. And then if you wanted to, you liquidate them afterwards. That's the logical thing to do if you want to win. And we assume that Hitler wanted to win. But that's not a very intelligent assumption. Why would you assume that? He wasn't exactly a good guy. So why should we assume that he was aiming at the good that he was promoting, even in his own terms, right? The glorious, everlasting Fourth, Third Reich, right? That'll rule for a thousand years and be a, a bastion of civilization and music, because that's the sort of thing he purported to be interested in. Well, so what do you do with the Jews and the Gypsies? Well, round them up, fine. Enslave them, fine. You don't kill them. You certainly don't devote a substantial proportion of your war resources while you're losing to accelerate the rate at which the extermination is taking place. Because that's a bit counterproductive, unless what you're aiming at is the maximum possible mayhem in the shortest period of time. Well, so what happened as the Germans started to lose the war? Did Hitler lose faith in his own ability? No, he believed that the Germans had betrayed him with weakness. And so he was perfectly willing to ex accelerate the rate at which Germany was losing the war. And so when Hitler and his minions had the choice, here's the choice. You can suspend your unnecessary demolition of people, win the damn war, and then pick it up afterwards, or while you're losing, you can just accelerate the mayhem even though it's counterproductive. It's like, what'd they pick? Well, they picked to accelerate the mayhem. 